Right, folks, welcome back to this week's Brew Time. And I have uh, Andy Hodgson and Rosalind Chaston, who together are Atlantic Escapade. How are you doing, guys? Good, yeah, great. thank Andrew. you. How are you doing? You all right? Awesome. Are you all good? All good. We were supposed to chat at the recent Armchair Adventure Festival, weren't we? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, that was the plan. Yeah, we were down there for the weekend. Yeah, I was gutted. I missed that. Well, I, I was there, but unfortunately we had a bit of a family emergency, so I had to dash home straight away, like a few hours after getting there on Friday. So we've got you on the podcast and we'll have a little chat. Um, before we get going, can I hand it over to you guys just to introduce yourselves and to say what Atlantic Escapade is all about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in 2018, Andy rode his boat solo around Britain mm -hmm. and then we met decided to do something a little bit warmer so decided to row across the Atlantic Ocean as a pair and we are setting off in January from Grand Canaria rowing 3,000 miles and finishing off in hopefully sunny Barbados. <laughs> now I, I have an admission here I made a mistake folks because I posted up on the socials to say that uh, Andy and Rosalind were doing the Talisker Atlantic Challenge, which is a Talisker whiskey thing every every yeah. December, isn't it? They they head off and they do straight across to oh, where where no, is it Antigua. they go? Yeah, so Antigua, it's really it. really similar route. So they go mm -hmm. Lagomera to Antigua. We're going Grand Canaria to Bar Barbados. So gotcha. same ocean, just slightly different start and finish. So are you guys gonna have? Are you guys going to have like a support vessel with you or anything like that? Because I know Talisker has a couple of boats that that are there just in case. That's the key difference. Yeah, we're going completely unassisted, like entirely on our own. Wow. So, yeah, like uh, yeah. If you're if you're part of the Telescope race, then you get a lot of uh, support and benefit mm -hmm. from the guys that organise it, and you get yeah. a support yacht. Um, we we can't. It's beyond our means, unfortunately. So yeah, mm. we're on our own, on our own. Wow, that adds a new dimension to it. Gee whiz. <laughs> yeah, there's a little little group of sort of rogue independents that have like special love for each other. So yeah, you know the the event is great and and it's really well organised, but it's just beyond us. So yeah, everyone that goes on their own, yeah, we're like independent rogues just sort of looking out for each other. Awesome, that is mega. Um, right, I tell you what, I forgot to do this. Very rude. Do you have a tipple of choice for the evening? Oh, at the moment I'm on the tea. Yeah, it's all right. we... no worries. Oh, I'm actually really upset we didn't get beers now. Yeah. You didn't that get beers in? I did tell you, didn't I? Did I yeah, not see you? Yeah, you did. All right. I just, I can't believe we've got, we can watch you with envy. Yeah. You oh, can no. describe how good it is to Tell us how it tastes, well, Bruce. I, I tell you, I was sent these. I need to say a big thank you to Mark. Mark Kent from um, Epic Motorcycle Adventures. It's a YouTube channel. Mark sent me these beers to try, to get me off Brewdog. He sent me some Brewdog as well, but he sent me these uh, from Vocation Brewery. Life and Death, it's called. Slange, <laughs> here's to your health. Slange, yeah. Ooh, that's citrusy. Is citrusy. Oh, yeah, it's holly hops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's lovely. It's very nice. Thank you, Mark. Cheers for that. Oh, it makes our tea sound yeah. really boring. <laughs> I did. I did. I did a, the last pod, last week's podcast. I did. I did with this uh, Danish chap called Thor. Thor. Yeah. yeah. Who's he's been on the road for nine years. He's gone to yeah. every single country around the world without flying. So he just got to Vanuatu. Yeah, Vanuatu. I think it's called, which yeah. is country two hundred for him in the South Pacific Islands. So it was like eight yeah. o'clock at night for him. Wasn't he hiding for me, in his bathroom. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the one. But for me, it was like eight o'clock in the morning. So I'm like, I can't have a beer, Thor. I'm I'm gonna have to let the side down and just have a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, back to you guys. So, uh, what what instigated this whole thing? Obviously, Andy, you have a little bit of a pedigree in terms of rowing. Yeah, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it weirdly like yeah for for me obviously around britain was a was kind of a different story like like very much like your around the world trip like i was caring for my nan and mm. um and when she passed away i was kind of left with not much to do and uh and i was living with her and lost the house and and working in the gig economy so i was kind of mm. at a massive loose end um and I'd read Ben Fogel's book. That guy's got a lot to answer for. And, uh, and, and just kind of wanted to try and think of the hardest thing I could possibly do and see if, if, see if it would kill me or if I could manage it. And, yeah. uh, and so that, that's when I, I sort of 
got into ocean rowing and it was going to like festivals, you know, and things like, like I was going to hub and I was going to overland and I was going to like the armchair festival and things like that. Oh. You see all these films and, and stuff of, of people just doing epic round the world trips or just like adventures. Uh, and I'd go away each year and I'd just be like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that, but it's not really for me. I'd just get back to the nine to five and, and yeah. crack on. And it just came, all came to a head after my, my nan passed away that I was just like, do you know what? I have to, I have to do something. I can't just keep saying, oh, I'd love that. I'd love that, but mm. maybe another lifetime. Uh, and so, yeah, just, just went for it and then sort of managed to get hold of a boat that was sort of secondhand that had been across the Atlantic a couple of times and, and then, um, yeah, sort of started training for for that and figuring it out. And, um, yeah, so, sort of two years on from that, I was found myself around the coast of Britain. And then no, I think I was pretty much juggled. retired. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it took me six months to circumnavigate the country and i was wow. living on the boat the whole time and and there's no shower there's no toilet facilities anything like that so six months yes yeah oh i mean i was God. in no rush so i was kind of like like no no one had done it before me so yeah so like there was no time to be i was just like exploring and um... honestly he spent so much time mucking about right so <laughs> For the uh, Armchair Adventure Festival, uh, we were doing a talk and, and I was editing together some videos just to, to show. And so I watched through every single video that he took on Round Britain of six months at sea. And there are literally videos of him rowing into caves, going, oh, that's Just nice. having a little look. <laughs> yeah, like, it's um, epic. Like down on the south coast, there's like these cathedral caves. And yeah. like, you, yeah. I've got, like, my boat's quite small, so I can just about get it into these caves. But then like the tide started coming in and it was getting a bit bouncy so i was like all right scarpa from here and carry on yeah. but yeah trying to learn spanish um <laughs> yeah. yeah there's loads of absolute so much mucking about yeah but after what? that i was i was pretty much retired i i didn't want to see that boat again so it's sat up in a barn in in rural oxfordshire somewhere and and i was trying to sell it and then met rosalind yeah that was kind of my fault and then you thought well this sounds like it could be a good idea yeah i mean so i never heard of ocean rowing i didn't really know it was a thing you could do to be honest um had never sailed or particularly been nautical at all and mm. i heard actually about within about two hours of meeting andy we were talking about doing the atlantic together wow because <laughs> um a friend we met through a friend of a friend and he said oh andy rode around britain and i went you did what well, you know what, what do you mean you rode around britain and yeah, I just thought it sounded like an amazing thing to do. So we decided to do the Atlantic together. Yeah, hatched a little plan. And, Fantastic. And yeah. And That's here we mega. Are. <laughs> so what, what's your background then, Rosalind? Are you, are you, you're, you're an ocean swimmer, is that right? You, yes, I do a lot of uh, swimming. I wouldn't... I'm, I'm not particularly good. I just enjoy it, really. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I... Part of my interest is that I work in science education and mm -hmm. a lot of my degree was oceanography and atmospheric physics and things. So I was very interested in it from, from that kind of point of view. So, yeah, I think the idea of being able to actually be at sea and sort of feel and experience the things that I've learned about is really exciting for me. So I actually want to go and do some more oceanography mm -hmm. um, in the future. We'll get the row out of the way first. In terms of in terms of the Atlantic row, then, if you're not part of the Talisca challenge, what 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 is it that you want to get from the row? Like, what's the purpose of the row for you guys? Then, I think there are there are a few sort of elements to it. It's not just one thing, but I think the main experience is just to get across. Mm -hmm. It's I think the sense of achievement we'll feel from having taken ourselves all the way across the Atlantic is, yeah, I think it'll be the hardest thing we've ever done, but I hope we finish sort of stronger than we started. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, it's that similar thing. It's, it's, I always like sort of pushing myself as hard as I can and, and not knowing if I can cope with it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of the draw for me. Uh, and just seeing like if, if it's actually 
possible for me to do it like you see some other guys that are all lined up at start line they're six foot eight built like rowers and stuff like yeah. that and then there's sort of little old me at, at five and nine just going hello <laughs> Uh, yeah it, it's like it, it, it's yeah. partly pushing myself as hard as i can and see if, see if i can cope with it and and otherwise it, you know like you do get a little call back to the ocean for mm. me like I, I was a surfer when i was at uni in bournemouth and and that's where a sort of love of the ocean came from and now if i'm ever that far away from it i kind of do feel like itchy feet i guess it's like like been on the road like mm -hmm. i think anyone that's traveled long distance would probably feel the same little urge after a little while you're like oh God, what's out over that hill and yeah kind of get back out there and do it again so mm -hmm. yeah for me it's that it's that yeah and i think the truth is we both kind of struggle with ordinary life a little bit <laughs> sometimes it's just also you know stressful and loud and stuff and i think just having that achievement at the back of your head to go uh you know I don't want to send this email, but mm. I have rode an ocean, so I can yeah. probably, muster up, <laughs> probably muster up the courage, you know. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember. For me, I I I felt like I got to a stage in life where I just that wasn't it, you know. Like I, I knew I knew there was more. It's like I I, I need more. I need more from from this because this is this just isn't it for me. I need something. Yeah. I need a challenge. And I've had a lot of people on this podcast who've done incredible things, you know, like walking across continents, cycling around the world, rowing the ocean, all sorts of stuff. And everyone seems to have that. Everyone seems to have this, this driving, I was going to say feeling or urge, but it's just, it's just something that is there that rears its head. Nothing, there's a catalyst for it, a death in the family, a near death experience, anything like that. But everyone seems to, everyone seems to have that burning, that yearning, whatever it is to achieve, whatever this is that they've set their sights on. And it, what you're saying there about, um, Andy, what you said about when you turn up at the start line, you've got all these great big, like six foot eight, six foot ten, proper like uni style rowers, you know, the big tall machines that you get. Yeah. Uh, the people I've spoken to who've who've done these ocean crossings uh, by by rowing boat, they've all said it's not a physical thing. That's the big thing that they've they've realised. It's it's mental. It's like the, there's not really the physical side to it, as in rowing. It, it's it's the mental challenge. That was way harder than they'd ever, ever anticipated. Did you find that in the UK, the uh, UK row? Yeah, for me, like, round Britain was exactly that. It, it, it's it's sort of much rougher and, and there's, yeah. like, conditions coming in from all sides, so it's not so straightforward. Like the Atlantic's bigger and scarier, but it's over much quicker. We're we're looking at maybe forty to sixty days across. Wow! Whereas around Britain, one hundred and seventy-five is like nearly six months, and it's yeah. it, it is that thing of just being committed to it, and and mm. then being able to get up on day ten, absolute agony, and going, okay, well, it's my shift. I've got to go. So yeah. it's time to leave. And like, no matter how your hands are cramping up or blisters on your ass or anything like that, you know, it's sort of is having the ability to get up for your shift and do it. I think that's mm. that's the key to it, definitely. It yeah. certainly was around Britain. I'm kind of hoping it will be across the Atlantic as well, because, yeah, from everything, from the guys that have come before us, they've all said the same. Yeah, it is, it's having that mental strength to keep going. That'll see you a lot further than physical strength. Yeah. And bottom management, as I've been told. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keeping yeah. your bum bum clean of salt. Yeah. You get to know each other really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, are you uh, you must be all right talking about this. Obviously, when you're away in a rowboat, you haven't got a toilet or anything, do you? There's no toilet. There's no. Can you describe your rowing boat? So this boat that you're going to take across the Atlantic, what does it look like? Yeah, so it, it's kind of like a normal rowing boat, just sort of supersized. So the deck where you actually row is same. You've got a sliding seat. You've got a foot plate for your feet to go in. But at either end, you've got um, sort of a lid on top. So it's basically mm -hmm. a cabin on either end. Only one of them you can sleep in, the other one's just for storage. And so at the sleeping end, it you climb in and then your feet extend underneath so that you can lie down flat. And it's completely watertight and it's probably about a one or two man tent size yeah. i would say i measured it at weirdly and it's the same volume as a telephone box so a little <laughs> live pod on one end is the size of a telephone box for two of you 
the two yeah. of us yeah yeah um, but like when we're rowing together yeah. like we'll be rowing together during the day like hours quite a lot and then rotating at night like three hours on three hours off so hopefully unless there's like a mega storm we'll only be one person in there at the time because yeah. mm. she's like a bedtime ninja and we'll <laughs> take <over. laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um so, yeah and then the deck is it it's essentially completely hollow so you mm. just pack it full of the food you need um you've got a water maker at one end and solar panels on top of both cabins so you're as long as you take enough food and you've got sunlight to run the water maker you're completely self-sufficient uh -huh. it's yeah you can spend they're, quite a long time on them. Yeah, they're very cool bits of kit. Like they're very well designed. It's, like, our one's made by a company in Essex called Rannick Adventure, and they make mm. various two, four, six size ones. Mine's an older version. Like it, they've come on a bit since mine, um, but it, but it's a neat little design, and it's kind of a flat bottom boat that will self right if it goes over. Like yeah. the air pockets on top, bring it back up, and so you've got your survival zone at one end, and then all your food in the other. So. Yeah, they, they really are not big, are they? I, in my little village, um, uh, where I take my dog for a walk sometimes, in one of the routes, I've just seen there's there's a, a talisker, a boat all liveried up in somebody's front front garden. I was oh, like, wow, really oh, blimey, wow, it is not big. It's the first time mm. I've seen one in the flesh. I was like, Jesus, that's going across the Atlantic. Wow. Yeah, it's a tiddly <laughs> boat for a big ocean, definitely. I've been down in Portsmouth all week at the historic dockyard showing people uh -huh. around the boat. And yeah. like kids have been coming on a half term, just jumping all over the boat, and they're like, "My bedroom's much bigger than this." <laughs> I'm like, I'll bet it is, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, what got us onto that topic was um, facilities on the boat. Facilities, now, obviously, yeah. there's no toilet, so there's the fabled bucket, isn't there? Everyone talks about the bucket because that is yeah. your bathroom. Bucket and bucket chuck and it. Chuck it. Yeah. Bucket and <laughs> chuck strategy. it. It's definitely yeah. a new level to our relationship. That's yeah. sure. <laughs> we have a firm no eye contact policy on board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's fair to say that you could describe me as poop shy. Like yeah. I'll, I'll avoid public toilets if I can, just yeah. for the fear that somebody's listening. But yeah, so like using a bucket on a boat, like it was fine on my own for for six months not a problem mm. although it always seemed to be the minute i go all right there's a lovely vista here your sun's coming up i'm gonna have a leisurely poop on deck you'd always get someone fisherman coming up their morning <laughs> <You're> like, oh. <laughs> but yeah the first time we had to use the bucket on the boat together was just like yeah. oh, our relationship's never going to be the same again now is it <laughs> well if you get through that you're going to get through anything aren't you yeah <laughs> it's kind of one of those things like you must have had it traveling and and I think a lot of people do. You just kind of crack on with it. It's sort of a, yeah, yeah. this is all you have to use. So yeah, yeah. don't make <laughs> eye contact, put your headphones in, go. <laughs> unless unless you've had a Barney, in which case you look straight in the eye, don't you? <laughs> oh, actually, what, I was rowing down the East Coast this summer with a mate of mine, and that was the first time, because on our training runs, I've just corked it and just been like, I'm just going to pack down the Imodium. There's no way I can survive two, three days, no problem. So I was rowing down the North Sea with a friend of mine called Duncan, and he uh, he's at X Forces. And so uh, he was wondering while I was shuffling around on deck, he said, what's the matter? And I'm like pacing back and forth. I'm going to have to use a bucket, mate. And he goes, yeah, so? And he's done loads of team rows and everything yeah. like that. So he's fine. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, I was sort of shuffling up and down the deck. And they went, oh, it's your first group poop. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, yeah, like, can you just go in the cabin and, and stuff? So uh, he he was like, nope, we're doing this. He was just yeah. like eyeballing me the whole time. And I was just like, I was like, can you look away? He's like, no, we're doing this. And I was like, yeah, You've got obviously. a love forces mentality, yeah. haven't you? Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. What does he call it? A group poop? Is that group what he calls poop. it? Yeah, a group poop. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's on the trailer. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I don't know if you guys know the format of of the Brewtime podcast. Basically, I post up on the socials um, a couple of days beforehand just to let people know who's coming on, and then um, folk have the opportunity to post up and. Uh, pose some questions to us to talk through. Sometimes it's got something to do with what it is you're doing, and other times it's totally random. So are you game? Crack it. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Right, let's go. Right, folks, 
As usual, we'll head to uh, the clan over on Patreon first of all, which is patreon.com forward slash teapot one. First one, Patrick. Andy and Rosalind, 3,000 miles across the Atlantic. It's quite the challenge. Fair play to you. I can only imagine the routine. Get up, eat, row, eat, row, eat, row, get some sleep, then do it again day after day. What are you going to do to take care of your mental health during this monumental journey? That's, that's quite a, a sensible question, question that's, actually. That's an epic that's question. Really it question. sounds like an ocean row already, because he was just <laughs> like, yeah, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, row, 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 row. Yeah. Yeah, the mental health side of it is like what we were saying earlier about, you know, the mental strength is is the toughest part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've we been going for two years on this project now just to try and raise the finances to do it. And so we've spent a lot of time talking through every scenario and how we want to treat each other in certain situations because there's going to be times you know it's going to be epic but there's other times where we're going to be utterly terrified and oh, yeah. like having like there's nothing quite as scary as nature and like when it's trying to jump up and kill you you, you feel like completely vulnerable so it, a lot of it is is teamwork and looking after each other uh and being responsible for each other and to each other uh, and that like you know don't turn up late for your shift if the other person's mm. out on deck for three hours make sure you're there bang on time to take over and and that sort of thing um yeah and i think in so in terms of sort of big strategies having those conversations before we go and before we're tired and before we're scared is really important because yeah. yeah. we do behave differently in those stressful situations so being able to deal with or or know how we want to be treated and know that that's how we've asked to be treated uh, is really important. But in terms of sort of smaller in the moment techniques, it's really a case of, it sounds so simple, but just taking a few breaths and Mm. kind of bringing yourself back to the moment. And we always say, uh, remember that we asked for this, Yes, you know, even when things are totally rubbish, just remember that, you know, however stressed you are, however much you want it to end, you have asked to do this. Yeah. So be in the moment for the good and the bad. Yeah. And the definitely. last one is biscuits. Yeah, <laughs> loads of biscuits, biscuits, loads of chocolate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be- that that'll that brings us on to something then. So in terms of like actually fueling this for you. You're going to be rowing pretty much, you know, not 24 hours a day, but pretty much non-stop for three odd thousand miles. What's your calorific intake every day? About, for me, about 4,000 calories, okay. about 5,000 for you. Yeah, five to six for me, yeah. But you are at a deficit then. It's just that you can't really pack that much more food in, or mm. I certainly can't anyway. Yeah. So the whole way across you're eating freeze dried rations, which mm. some people find disgusting, whereas I, I kind of like them. Quite like so, it. Yeah, yeah. It's I better mean, than my cooking. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've been eating them all week out, out at the yeah, dock. Yeah. So yeah, I've just been like trying all the flavors and going, oh yeah, this one's all right. And people are like, mm. he's taking it seriously. He's on dry land and just eating out of a kettle and freeze dried <laughs> rations. Yeah, I mean, I I quite like them, but like each pouch is like a thousand calories of like rehydrated posh pot noodle, and it's mm-hmm. um it, like Ross says, it's it's tough to squeeze in any more than that. Like yeah. we'll take like biltong and chocolate and nuts and stuff to to sort of supplement, but yeah, you, you most people go and lose like twelve to fifteen kilos across the ocean, and yeah. You, yeah, like mm-hmm. Ross says, you're in deficit every day because you're just working so hard. Best diet plan in the world, if anyone. <laughs> You know, yeah, we might he's interested. It's, it's quite, it's quite a not only extreme diet. It's a bloody expensive diet, isn't it? Like it really is. I know the Talisker one. Is that about 160 grand or something that you you have to raise? Is you yours similar do. for that? Then I, I'm you, assuming. No, well, a, a big cost of the Talisker is, is the entrance fee, and um, and most people are going from absolute nothing to you know zero to hero. And yeah. and again, that's what the Talus is amazing for. They'll take people that have never, you know, been down to the beach and yeah. they'll they'll qualify them and train them and their safety record's impeccable. But it is really expensive. And like I, I think ocean rowing's always been very expensive since the mm-hmm. 60s when really the first sort of modern era row happened. Um but for us, like we don't come from that background. We're not, but you know, it, when we're not well funded and and we want to try and keep the sport 
accessible for people yeah. like us. So we're going into our state schools and t- talking to the kids that are there now and saying, you know, get on it. You can you can try and make it happen. But, yeah. but it is a struggle. It's a real struggle yeah. to get to the start line. And, and the cost of the food is one of them. It's like, you know, yeah. you know, a, thousands of pounds of freeze dried rations that you're coming yeah. into the boat and and you've got to find the money for that so are you are you still looking for sponsorship both in terms yeah. of i know you're doing it for two charities rnl rnli and is it the blue blue marine foundation is that right yeah yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we we can chat about them in a second but um I, I take it if, if somebody wants to uh, not just support those charities but if they wanted to support you guys are, are you accepting like donations from people in terms of that we are yeah we we've got loads of ways to do it we're kind of selling raffle tickets when we can we're down at supermarkets shaking the bucket and we're we're trying to get companies to sponsor as well so yeah we're still about eight grand short of the money that we need to go like we started off by putting sort of 10 grand of our savings in ourselves and then the rest we needed to raise from company sponsors and things. So we've got like a, a little hundred club of like a hundred smaller businesses to donate a mm-hmm. hundred quid, which is sort of more manageable and more personable. Cause like we know most, we've had a face-to-face conversation with most of the businesses that have donated money. So they care yeah. about us getting over. So yeah. I think so, sort of quite often, you know, I don't know if anyone from Goldman Sachs is listening and if they are, then please, you know, get in touch. <laughs> but like the marketing department there doesn't much care about what we're doing and and whereas the guys that are supporting us really really care about not mm. not just us making it but our safety and and they want yeah. us to do well so yeah like we're still doing that and yeah we've got 10 weeks to raise eight grand and um which is a little bit frightening yeah. but like but we've kind of bodged our way through this far and we reckon we'll bodge our way through the last 10 weeks and yeah hopefully we'll I, was, I was just thinking you know like on for my trip what what i did is i I um, I offered people. It was just an idea I got from from people I knew racing in the TT, the Isle of Man TT, and they had a thing where you could get your name on the fairing of the bike for a hundred quid, you know, and and they just go that, just just do that, try it, and I thought, well, I'll try it and see. So I whacked it up, and it and it did really well. I think I got like 30, 40 people paid the 100 quid to put their name on the fairings. And then I did the same for companies. I think it was 200 quid and a company could get their logo on. And it helped, you know, everything does help for sure. But then what I found for me, which obviously I appreciate you guys can't do, was that I was sort of halfway round. I was almost down into Australia and I was pretty much running out of money. So I've, I just sort of said on my socials, just to give you the heads up, when I get, you know, when I get to Oz, when I get to Sydney, that'll be me. I'll be heading back, end of the line. That's me done. And people were just like, no, you can't, you can't, you can't stop now. You've got to keep going. You've got to get all the way around. Yeah. So for me, it was like, well, I'm, I'm planning on doing a book and a DVD. So you can pre-order that now if you want. And and you, you know that will let me finish the trip, and then I'll I'll just have to get back to work when I'm home, and you know pay for the printing and everything. Uh, so I did that, and that literally in a space of about three days, that raised me not far off of ten grand. I think it was about eight and a half grand, nine grand. Wow. It was cr- incredible. But obviously, you guys can't do that because you're going to be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So yeah, you know, yeah. Um, it's the weird thing about, or it's what's difficult about ocean rowing is that whilst it's an adventure and we want to do it because of the adventure Mm -hmm. the amount of planning you have to go out with every single thing lined up like you have to have spares for everything you have to have the money you have to have all the training so it's almost two years of spending all your time on the laptop for two months actually having adventure so it's quite a weird one i think certainly afterwards we want to do something a little more spontaneous yeah the the next project is going to be like 40 days of planning for two years away or something like that just flip it over i got you yeah Yeah. i was like i i I was like three years i gave myself you don't need it but i gave myself three years and i look back now and think do you know what if i if i was of the mindset to go again like as in right i'm doing this not oh i'd love to do it but right it's happening i would literally wake up tomorrow passport credit card head to call it head to like folks and get the tunnel and go that would be me that would be the extent of my planning i think if i ever was to do something like that again um but you know hindsight's a wonderful thing isn't it when you when it was your first time when it's your first 
big adventure like that, you want to plan, you want to make sure you've ticked everything off and you're catering for every eventuality. So so bringing that back then, so there still is plenty of room if people want to get behind you and support not only the charities, but also you guys yourselves on the trip. And where would they go to do that? So all the information is on our website at atlanticescapade.com. And we have right. a GoFundMe on there for the 100 Club. And so the 100 Club does get your logo on the side of the boat. So oh, cool. we'll take it to Barbados with us if anyone's interested. Yeah. And then and we give like little monthly giveaways and things like that for, for all the gang that are kind of backing us. We like, uh -huh. like a lot of companies like Overboard and companies like that have sort of given away bags for us and stuff. So we can chuck stuff out each month to to thank everyone that's that's chucked in some cash. Mm -hmm. And oh, then brilliant. if anyone works for a company, uh, <laughs> We have sort of the bigger, more corporate sponsorship availability as well. So you can just get in touch on the website and we'll sort you out. But honestly, folks, if, if that's something that you think either you personally or, or a company that you work for, a company you own, uh, don't forget if it's a company you own, there are tax breaks there for a charitable donation. Remember that. Um, <laughs> head to their website there'll be links down below so if you're listening to the podcast check out the show notes if you're watching the youtube vid make sure you head uh, you head to the description there after you've liked and subscribed obviously um and uh go from there excuse me for interrupting folks but it is sponsor shout out time and this month we have a new sponsor welcome to travel escapes now i've got some blurb to read out travel and escape is an independent travel agent they are abta and at all protected for your peace of mind for hassle-free tailor-made holidays Holidays from staycations, day experiences, cruises, luxury holidays, and so much more. You can find them all on the socials or book directly online using the link. Now, folks, I'll leave all their socials and the website link down below. Make sure you check that out. If you're watching a video, have a look at the vid description. If you're listening to the podcast, check out the show notes. There will be hyperlinks there. Make sure you give them a click, a follow, a like. And if you're looking for a little break for you and the loved one, you and the family, you and whoever, maybe just you yourself, make sure you check out Travel and Escape. We are also sponsored by Inov. Now, Inov have been a long-term sponsor for the main channel over on Teapot One, but they're also helping out and sponsoring the podcast. So a massive thanks to them. Inov specialise in motorcycle dash cam systems. They do uh, the front and rear uh, dual camera K series. That's the K3 and the flagship K5. K3 is 1080 front and rear. K5 is 4K at the front, 1080 at the rear. The K5 also has much faster Wi-Fi. So both the K3 and K5 utilize a, a mobile app where you can view your footage, you can change settings, you can share on socials, you can have a look at your GPS overlay, all this sort of stuff. Both do the job if you just simply want a dash cam. If you ever get involved in an accident, the first thing your insurance is going to ask is, is there any CCTV? And obviously, if you have one of these systems fitted, then you can turn around and go, yes, I do. And if you head to inov.co.uk and use the code teapot you'll get five percent off of all inov and Techologic cameras so a massive thanks to inov and lastly for this one we're also sponsored by ultimate add-ons now ultimate add-ons they make dustproof and shockproof mobile phone uh, cases and action camera mounts they will fit just about every single bike out there me personally i always use the helix strap mount because it means i can easily attach that to just about any bike that i'm uh, riding at that time i can jump on and off on bikes and just easily unscrew the the strap whack it on the next bike tighten it all up and off i go it's very versatile Versatile. I've had no vibration issues affecting my camera using the Helix strap. That's the one that I will stand by and swear by. Been using it about five years now. So again, if you head to Ultimate Add-ons, that's Ultimate with A D D O N S, ultimateaddons.com. If you use the code Teapot110, so T E A P O T O N E with the number 10, you'll get 10% off all ultimate add-ons okay that'll do us for now let's get back to the podcast right excellent okay well hopefully we'll be able to help you out with that then because um it's incredible the re the the generosity of people is just phenomenal it's it it still to this day blows me away when people just people are just incredibly generous at times aren't they it's i fantastic. really think so and yeah. it's something that you know sometimes we get a little bit down that it is yeah. such of a struggle but then you just meet people who at this, you know, we've had a pandemic and now we're in a cost of living crisis and people are still there to support you. And I always think it's 
all we found that it's often the people who aren't you know billionaires who are really just invested and really want you to succeed so i'm it is hard but i think it's a really nice way to fundraise is the kind of smaller more personal wall donations because like andy says we know pretty much everyone who's donated we've met Mm -hmm. them at an event or a car park or something so yeah i think we are very much humbled when people donate to us it's a really nice feeling yeah Yeah, i mean it is that thing isn't it like we don't deserve the money any more than anyone else and it's just like that thing it's like we've gone as far as we can go ourselves and for someone just to turn around and go oh, chuck your tenner there you mm-hmm. go like you know that they've worked for that money and it's sort of yeah it's mm-hmm. pretty cool that that people will back you and it's nice to do things that people want to get behind and and back so absolutely yeah, yeah. well i i have obviously we're answering patron questions at the moment i have patreon and i call my little sort of community on patreon the clan and, and it I've I've had that running for two years now since I left the old bill and I, I couldn't I couldn't do this full time without without them you know they make up well over half my wage and that is just people out of the kindness of their heart paying you know anywhere 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 from a quid to I've got someone that pays two hundred and fifty pounds a month would you believe it or not Wow I mean it, it, and I know that person and I'm just like yeah. what are you doing that's insane <laughs> but it's incredible that like the generosity from people still to this day blows me away. So yeah, thank you and <laughs> to everybody out there. <laughs> right. Um, next one, Pete English. All right. Pete, Pete's a bit of a legend in the clan. Uh, let's see what his question says here. Hi, guys. Hope you're both fitting well. My question, out of all the normal negative emotions the human has, greed, anger, jealousy, and hate, which one would you say affects you the most? Oh, Keep up the great Ooh. work and live your life. He always <laughs> poses good questions, this Pete. He does, yeah. So... Does it Negative. have to be one of those four, greed, anger, jealousy, or hate? I would say no. If you can think of another one that you regard as negative, then, yeah, feel free. I am, I, I'm plagued with self-doubt. Mm. Yeah. Massively. Like, uh, like uh, and probably a slightly negative disposition. I'm a glass mm. half empty kind of guy. Are you? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it serves me well. Um, and other times, uh, you know, I, I, I battle against it quite a lot but like i've had trouble with depression in the past and and mm. definitely like it is something i struggle with and um and yeah definitely i can admit i'm a glass half empty person mm. um yeah it, and, and it, i i think sometimes you know the benefit of doing trips like this is actually it sort of gives you a shake up a little bit and you go come on like pull yourself together like there's worse yeah. things out there and there's yeah. people mm-hmm. having a tougher time than you are and so but yeah, self doubt is is probably my biggest thing. Like when we see other other people doing really well and and like get their teams and their stuff together for the Talisker race and things like that. Yeah. And like oh, and like you said, like the amount of money they have to raise to do it, we're we're trying to raise a fraction of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're like, why does no one like us? Why has no one helped us? It's that sort of thing. And and almost like, oh, well, I'm not as big as that guy, so we're not going to be able to do it. And like, this mm-hmm. isn't for us. So yeah, like. Um, I don't know. Luckily, I've got Rosalind to just give me a boot up the ass. So <laughs> I'm a bit more of an optimist. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, it would probably be anxiety. I've struggled with anxiety a bit in the past and used to get quite a lot of panic attacks. Mm. Um, also, I suppose a self-doubt kind of disposition. But yeah, and I think that's what I'm sort of worried about on the boat is that for me the actual rowing bit is fine because mm-hmm. you've got you know however painful it is you know what you're doing for the next yeah. two hours eight hours whatever but once you get off that and everything's just uncomfortable and you're sort of you know you're too hot you it's too stuffy in the cabin and you're not clean i think the 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 sort of anxiety could rise and and Obviously, having a panic attack in the middle of the ocean is not ideal because it really takes it out of you. But yeah, so I'd say I'd say probably that one. Do you think it's that first first week, isn't it? That's that's what I've heard. The first week getting away from the Canary Islands is pretty much the toughest. It's the hardest to to get away from the the because obviously the the water's a lot shallower, isn't it? So it's much more affected by tides, the weather, everything like that. And then once you're out over the ocean. So they say it gets a little bit easier. 
Yeah, it is that. Yeah, like definitely from everything that that people have told me, it, it's exactly as you said. Like around the coastline, it's tougher conditions, and you've got mm. winds that are affecting the boat. You're also seasick that first week anyway, yes. so you're, yes. you're feeling rotten and yakking up over the side and and trying to get out there. Uh, and then on top of that, the moment you kind of lose sight of shore. Yeah. is is i remember when it happened to me like the first time i like look out on the horizon there's just nothing there and you're like oh which way am i pointing and and you check the compass and you're like, okay well like, right, here we go we're, now now we're doing this and so i think yeah surviving that first week is is probably the toughest bit i think if you if you're gonna drop out it's gonna be then mm-hmm. and then uh, the deeper you get into it, the the I guess the less scared of the conditions you are each each day, and then you hit a point of no return where actually yeah. it's quicker to finish than it is to try and turn around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you been following? Um, oh, I, every time I talk about him, I forget his surname. Damien, the big Irish. Damien guy. Brown. Yes. Damien yes. Brown. Oh yes. God, yeah. I would love to get Damien on here for a chat. That guy, a legend. I, I mean, he is. Never mind. I mean, the guy is an ex-Irish rugby player, isn't he? So he's a big old lump, but he has mental strength that I don't think can be paralleled by many people on this planet. Absolutely. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's just, folks, if, if you're not aware of this chap, he's just finished rowing from basically New York, Manhattan, back to Galway. And he was supposed to be doing it with another chap, with his mate, another rugby player. But his mate his mate developed some sort of health issue very early on. So had to get Kazi backed off of the, the boat. That gives you some idea because he was, he was still close enough that I think to be heli, heli yeah. backed off, wasn't he? So Damien has not only, not only rode single handedly back across the Atlantic ocean, he's gone the other way, hasn't he? Everyone, everyone normally goes east to west because of the trade winds and yeah. he's, He's just done west to east, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he did like uh, New York to Ireland. So yeah, oh. that sort of North Atlantic route coming back over there. That's that's the tough one. Like the weather is savage and it, it is a rough row. Yeah. We we actually weirdly we spoke to Gussie, his teammate, yeah. a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and he's fully recovered now. He's well and he and he's he's safe on dry land. But yeah, I think he was gutted to have to be taken off, but like his health was that mm. serious yeah, reason. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, like Damien having that mental strength. Imagine the first day alone when your mates, like you're worried about your mate and you're sitting yeah. there on the boat and you're suddenly alone. Yeah. And then just to have the strength to just carry it on mm. for a long time after. Yeah. He's just like digging on and he had a proper rough crossing. And the North a- Atlantic gets some proper weather, oh, yeah. so many low pressure systems. And he was in some... Yeah, not and very then, nice stuff. I, I don't know the full story. I'd love to talk to him about it, but like when he landed, he was like getting blown off Galway, where he was mm. sort of expecting to land. That's and right. I think like his attitude was pretty much like he was stuck out there for a couple of days, and he's like, ah, stuff this, and he just rammed it into rocks and hopped off. He's he like, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm done now. <laughs> yeah. This will do. Yeah, yeah. He's he's super like, um, cool. But I yeah. think when you've achieved that, like, uh, yeah, you absolutely you can. You're just like, I'm done. Off I get. That's me yeah. finished. Because like, he's uh, the. I think it was it last year or the year before. He he rode solo in the Talisker, didn't he? So he's already done it once, and he he destroyed his arse, didn't he? He had yeah. he really suffered with the salt blisters and salt wounds and yeah. everything off there. So, yeah. I've yeah, seen then, some horror show photos from. Yeah, people. you see oh, some yeah. fun photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you've ever God. seen a kid with chicken pox, that just doesn't even <laughs> doesn't start. <laughs> and there's no getting that. away from it on a rowing boat, is there? Because you're on yeah. your arse for, yeah. for two thirds of the day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So th- this is interesting from the two of you then. Self doubt and, and anxiety, and ag- anxiety, I can't even say it. Um, they're the two things that you think could pr- probably affect you the most out of this trip. That's phenomenal that even though you're aware of that, you're still going for this. So is is this like a big, is this like a big personal uh, challenge then for you? As in, I'm aware of what might be affecting me or what will affect me as I go, but I'm going to beat that. Let's go. So you can take it off and go, yes, it's done. Yeah, it's a three months therapy session. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, <yeah. laughs> um, it, it, it is. Yeah, it's a part of like knowing that that's a, not a necessarily a personality flaw, but that is a part of my personality. And so, it's it's not drumming it out of me, but like 
challenging it, taking it face on. And, mm. and uh, for a lot of my life, I wouldn't. I'd shy away from it and hide from it and yeah. suffer as a consequence. But yeah, I think if you can, if you can try and face it head on, then mm. you can. And that's that's kind of yeah, definitely another motivation for the row. Mm. And I think also it's it's almost the beauty of doing trips like this, whether it's traveling overland on the water, whatever. It's putting yourself in a situation where you just have to deal with it. Yeah. It's I think often, like I said earlier, it's more the everyday things that that personally I struggle with. And so almost the simplicity of the ocean rowing boat is all you have to do is manage to feed yourself, row and sleep. Like yeah. that is it. And so even if you're feeling all these emotions, just you have one task at hand and it is just so, so simple. So at least for me, it, I don't know. It's quite therapeutic, just the monotony mm. of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice way of life, isn't it? It's it's kind of like uh, doing simple things, doing it. Well, maybe not being at sea, but like mm. it is is that simplicity of like of camping, of traveling, of doing a, a, a challenge like this. It is that that simplicity of like right task at hand, got that, and then eat and sleep and done. It's yeah. it, a nice way yeah. of getting up in the morning. Some of the some of those everyday stresses like just wash away yeah i i i that's my attitude to to like overland travel on a bike you know when pe people go oh I would, I would love to do what what you did but I, I don't think i'd be capable of it that's just such an amazing achievement and stuff and i i don't want to play down what what i did and what other people have done when they've when they've done trips like that but to me it was just like it's easy. You're just getting on a bike and riding a bike. You know, it's just, you just deal with whatever comes your way. And I took the mindset very much of what, what um, you were saying earlier there, Rosalind, that all life's strains that you have to deal with day to day when you're here, you don't need to worry about out there because you're just constant. For me, it was like, where am I going? Where am I going to get fuel? Where am I going to get food? Where do you go to the bathroom? All this sort of stuff, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just, life in almost its most simplest forms so you didn't need to worry about any of that and then the shock for me was coming back to the real life and going oh, shit, i've got bills to pay well you know right yeah. we've got to get back to normal life here yeah, yeah. I, I had the same thing after britain like yeah, uh, i was riding back up the thames and and i'd gone like you know you could go 10 11 days without seeing a soul or speaking to anyone and yeah. then six months of that and i'm rowing back up the thames in november and london is noisy and busy and, and it's crowded. fireworks wasn't it? yeah it's was fireworks weekend so i was like i pretended it was all there for me and so yeah, yeah. Like, oh thanks guys but the only thing i wanted to do was turn the boat around and row Did it you? back out the thames yeah. I, like i was terrified of who would be waiting for me when yeah. i got to land or like just the crowd of people it was suddenly yeah really really intimidating so it is yeah it's a weird thing weird feeling wow that's a, that was a good question, that Pete. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, next one, Patrick Collum. Hope the trip goes well. My question, is there any is there any trip other than by rowing that really excites you? Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. here we go. Yeah. Well, this, <laughs> go on in. Well, um, I, after I'd finished around Britain, I, I, again, I was sick of the boat. I didn't want to see it ever again before I met Roz. <laughs> and uh, I'd bought myself an old Honda Dominator and I was going to do what you did and, and ride it around the world. And, really? Uh, it's currently still sat in the garage, just there, just waiting. But um, maybe we'll go twos up or get a sidecar like Matt. No, 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 I'll cycle. He can go on a motorbike. You're going to cycle? Wow. Well, I'd like to. I... I think weirdly, my mum is okay with me rowing an ocean, but the thought of me going on a motorbike terrifies her. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, we certainly want to do some overland afterwards. Mm, yeah, uh, you know, meeting so many people over the last two years who have done some absolutely incredible sort of trips, mm. like yourself. Everyone at the Armchair Festival is amazing. Yeah amazing it's incredible and, isn't it when you go to those events yeah. and you're just like oh my god you've done what <laughs> yeah. It, yeah like yeah. everyone that goes there could have written a book yeah do you know mm. what i mean it's like it, it's just the people turning up and going let alone the speakers they're like everyone's gone and had a trip of their mm -hmm. own or done something yeah. or, or has a trip planned yeah. and so yeah. overlanding and, definitely and it is kind of a the truth is with ocean rowing a bit different with round britain but for the atlantic 
once you've left shore, you don't see anything mm -hmm. until you get to shore, right? Okay, so you see the sea in different conditions, the weather, maybe some wildlife, hopefully, probably a lot of plastic, but <sighs> you don't get the human element or anything like mm -hmm. that. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah we definitely want to do some overland afterwards. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what surprised me when I was traveling was the people that I met who were doing incredible, incredible adventures. Some some people have been on the road for decades and they had no, they were making no fuss about it. They had no website, they had no social media. They weren't raising money for anybody. They weren't doing it. They were just out there. And like, I met, I met a guy who was walking for, he was, okay, he's raising money. He was walking for peace, but he'd been on the road for like 15 years, just wow. walking the planet. And he, I've, I've talked about him loads on this podcast. He looked like, uh, you know, in Life of, Life of Brian, when the, they meet the guy who's in a hole in the ground and he's he taken a vow of silence. Yeah. And then they, I think they stood on his foot and he was like, <laughs> Jehovah, Jehovah. This, this chap was the spitting image of him. He was all, he was long gray hair. He was wearing like a linen gown. He was pulling a trolley behind him with a big placard. Like 15, 20 years he'd been on the road for. And he just, he had no money. He lived off of whatever people gave him when he was out walking. Wow. You know, people, if, he, if no one gave him any food, he didn't eat. And it was just simple as that. I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. I met people that were cycling, unicycling, unicycling, <laughs> like down through the Americas. And he yeah. didn't, he, this young lad didn't even have social media. He was doing nothing. Just, yeah. just did it because he wanted to do it. It's such a nice way of traveling as well. Because, I mean, I think sometimes you can get a bit tied up into all the social media stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of like, like for us, we've got loads of supporters. So we, we want to feed back and, and yeah. keep everyone up to date with what we're going. And, it, and there is a sort of slightly, I don't know, for want of a better word, a slightly business element to ocean rowing it's like it's like it, it's an expensive thing to undertake and so you have to mm -hmm. like give back and support like both ways people want yeah, to get that mm -hmm. but I, yeah that that kind of idea of just going and not you know not picking your phone up for months on end or anything mm -hmm. like that and just not having any of that would just i'd be lush yeah i'd love that yeah. i i really understand that i totally get it but i'm Maybe it's because I've done it for so long now, but I, I actually really enjoy, I enjoy capturing stuff. And then I enjoy creating like the editing, creating a video that you can then share that with people. Because you, what I've found is that the feedback, okay, you get feedback from ranging from that shit right through to people like will privately message you and go, I'm near the end of my life. I've always wanted to do what you, you've done. Thank you so much for sharing that with me because it's something, that's the only way I'm going to experience it. You know, you get the two polar extreme ends of the, the spectrum. And and obviously the negative ones niggle away at you, but they're like one in one in a hundred, one in a thousand, but they're the ones that you go, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's those, those really amazing, humbling messages you get from people that you just go, Okay, right. That that actually makes a difference to somebody's life. So that is epic. Let's yeah. film it. Let's do something with it. But I totally get it. When I've spoken to other people who've done a trip that they've documented, and then they've done another trip where they've done nothing, and they've just enjoyed it. And yeah. I get that. I do get that. But I think I, for me personally, I'd be like, mm, I feel like I'm. I feel like I've left something at home if I didn't. Yeah. If I didn't do I the whole. I think it's just YouTube it's thing. just balancing it. Like some people mm. enjoy storytelling, right? Yeah. It's you know for some people it is part of it whether that's taking photos blogs making videos i think it's just not putting too much pressure on yourself that Aye. oh i have to do yeah. you know a blog to ten thousand people by the end of december or whatever yeah. it's sort of enjoy the process of the storytelling as much as yeah. you enjoy the process of the traveling yeah and it, i mean it, it generates ideas doesn't it like like you know, you again go to the festivals and things and yeah. just hear people's stories mm -hmm. and what they've done. You're like, oh, yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. Like, maybe I'll take a bit of this and a bit of that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and and the truth know. is, we'd never have got into ocean writing if it wasn't for other people having shared their story. Yeah. And a lot of the same with people who cycle or motorbike. You know, you don't know it's a thing until someone tells you. So, yeah, yeah I think it's it's getting the right balance. Definitely. And and it is such an amazing feeling to have someone come up to you at one of these events when you go there and go, you know, like they shake your hand and they go, it's because of you 
that I've chosen to do X. And you're just like, oh my God, that's insane. That's incredible. Because as you just said, you know, there's there's people I watch that hub events. There's Ewan McGregor, Charlie Borman, I watched a long way around that initially lit the fire for me, you know. So it's nice just to pass it on, isn't it? Somewhere yeah. along the line. Speaking yeah. of which, are you going to document this trip then when you're away actually rowing? We'll take cameras and we'll mm-hmm. film what, what we're up to. Um, haven't really considered that we, we would... Uh, you know, post it or make a film or anything like that. Cause it's kind of like once, once you've seen that three times, <laughs> you've seen it a hundred times, but, but it's yeah, the human, I mean, it's the human experience. It's the, it's the effect yeah. it has on you as people. Yeah. That's what yeah. I think. So we're certainly going to take uh sort of cameras to post as we go. Mm-hmm. So we'll be sending videos back via sort of via the satellites so that you can track us as we go. Um, and I'll film every row. <laughs> yeah, you can miss out the bucket. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah, should I mean... stare into the bucket. And film it. <laughs> Sorry, stare into the camera when you're in the bucket. <laughs> I'll send have... it to your mate. Yeah, we 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 did have this thing that we started doing where we had to take photos of us oh, rowing. I can't believe you're telling me. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> We're getting personal now, please. The, I um, like it. The, uh, <laughs> where, where we have a game where we've had photos of each other, like rowing on our training runs and stuff like that. And we crop out our faces and we're like, can you guess if this photo was rowing or pooping? Because like the strain on our faces when we're rowing is like, we're like contorted and pulling like odd faces. We're like rowing or pooping. <laughs> is is yeah. this, is this uh, something that people in the 100 club get to experience? They will do during the ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to, well, once we've got up to like sort of a grid of 60 photos or something, we'll send we'll them out. And like, okay, it might Probably. not be public knowledge, just for the 100 clubbers, because uh, I'm not sure how the sponsors might feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Uh, okay, cheers for that, Patrick. Next one, Mark Kent. Ah, Mark Kent. It's the chap that sent me the beers. Cheers, Mark. Good evening, all. Bruce, I hope you enjoy the beers. Yes, mate, it's going down <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Andy and Rosalind, my question... Uh, my question for you, with space being so tight, what would you say is the one thing that you couldn't be without on this journey but isn't actually needed? Oh. Ooh. So a luxury. That's really good. Um, for me, it's music. Like uh, music and headphones, like um, it, it just sort of takes you out of the pain when you're in pain and it, and actually, again, when you're terrified. When I, when I was rowing over the top of Scotland from Cape Wrath to John O'Groats, absolutely terrifying and, yeah. and all i did was stick my headphones in and i had i'd had just music on the speaker the whole way uh, around the rest of the coast there's something happened when i hit cape wrath where i was just like just stick it in your ears and close yourself off hood up don't look outside just get going and and yeah so for me like music and obviously like that you need to keep that charged up and so mm. it's kind of a waste of batteries and kind you know it, it's all coming off the same system that runs the water maker and the navigation and everything like that but i just couldn't do without it without the motivation without the security yeah. without that and like uh, stand-up gigs as well like i try and download some comedy stand-up because again uh-huh. it's just like having someone chatting to you and telling jokes yeah yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. For me, it's probably party rings. <laughs> party rings? What's party that? Rings. Like the little biscuits. Oh, right. With the holes in the middle. And yeah. the icing and stuff on the yeah, top. Yeah, of- yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anything that makes you feel like a five-year-old. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, I found that because it is essentially so boring, food is kind of your interest every day. It's the one thing that changes, right? And... Having a little party ring absolutely cheers you up no end. <laughs> <laughs> so are you rationing one a day or one every couple of days? Or no. Oh no, we're having a pack a day, Bruce. Yeah. A pack a day. A pack. <laughs> Bloody but, hell. Like not not the whole tray, just yeah. like a, a kids bag. Kids like bag a one. Kids yeah. party bag. Type. Are you are you making little um little bags of of yeah. food that you, yeah I've seen other people do that yeah with like yeah. trail mix and just loads of calorie stuff calorific exactly. stuff yeah. yeah all of that yeah see I'd love all that it's just the actual rowing bit that would get me <laughs> yeah I mean like Christmas is guilt free this year we can yeah. eat anything yeah. we want just stuff yeah, our faces absolutely. until we go yeah definitely yeah. definitely what's the actual date that you leave you head off it's a little bit variable because. Because we're not going as part of the race, we kind of have the flexibility to go when the weather is best. Gotcha. But we're aiming for the last week of January, but it mm-hmm. might be a couple of weeks 
afterwards before yeah but around I it, sorry, go on. right and i take it you have you do you have a team here on land that's going to be looking at weather and plotting routes and stuff for you yeah luckily like from my round britain row like uh, i met loads of guys that are so much more experienced than me and they're like some of the best out there like uh, angus collins is going to do our weather routing and he's just a legend in the sport he's done yeah. the atlantic and the pacific and he's got records on on all those rows um so he's going to be on the end of the satellite phone giving me all the weather information and helping us out with routing and uh, and like throughout our training duncan roy who he uh -huh. trains half of the talisca teams yeah, he, yeah again he's record holder for the pacific and all of that and so yeah he's been like have you thought about this have you done that and like how's your boat set up and yeah. everything like that so yeah we're like really well supported um with with the the crew on on land but um yeah, it's sort of when you say it's a you know unsupported road, just the two of us. It, it's just us out there, but yeah, like the build up to it is, is you know a huge team effort, and and the guys backing you up at home. Yeah, they're there on the end of the phone every time you're a little bit terrified. Go, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> have you found that because because you're not doing it as part of Talisca, have you found that the ocean rowing sort of community? almost give you a bit more cute i don't want to belittle what talis could do because it is fantastic and it and it and it does allow it does allow not anyone but anyone who has the financial means and the 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 mental aptitude to do it it it, it gives you a vehicle to do that doesn't it but for you guys obviously you're you're out out with that safety bubble so do you find that the the community itself is treating you any differently I think it really depends who it's there's so much crossover between the Talisco and the independence anyway. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think that I think the the crews in the Talisco and 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 even the guys that organize it, you know, they sort of give us a slightly wide berth. Um, but the, the crews are super cool. They're, they mm. they sort of understand the same thing that like mm. once you're there, once you're rowing across the ocean, you, you still got to put the same effort in you still got to row across the yeah. ocean your own, yourself no matter how yeah. you got to the start line um but yeah like i was saying like, there is definitely a, a certain element of independent guys that are just like yeah 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 well yeah. done you like on your own like get out there so yeah like you know the, i think the the crews that have gone independently in the past um give you a little extra time and and a little extra like you know little encouragement so mm. yeah there's like a little little clan of rogues out there that that go independently and it's also so, yeah. there are some people within sort of the community and the sport who are just so generous with their time i'd say uh there's a company called monkey fist as well who are running yeah another atlantic crossing so called the uh -huh. atlantic dash which is yeah. starting in january and billy from there is sort of just is always there to answer whatever questions what if you're doing the race if you're independent you know and i think sort of other people as well angus that we said duncan uh dawn wood who does a lot of coaching for like first aid and things like uh -huh. that a lot of people of those figures really just want you to get across and they're really yeah. supportive so i think whether you're doing the telescope or not they're really happy to answer questions so it is really cool to have those people to share their experience yeah there's there's definitely people out there that have, that have done it before and happy to give you their time to to mm. help you out across and they kind of know what you're up against when you're on your own so they're yep. just like okay well this is what you need to do and this is how you're going to get it get it done awesome so, yeah. awesome now, uh, billy he seems a real i was i followed his uh trip over last year was it last year year before yeah I followed... with, across the atlantic yeah, oh, yeah. Four, they did a four, didn't they? It was a foursome yeah. that they, they went across. Um, oh my god, I've forgotten. Dirty Sanchez, the guy from Dirty Mac Sanchez, yeah. Mackie Pritchard. Pritchard, Pritchard. Yeah. I've, I've had him on the podcast. I'm so sorry. He's been on the <laughs> podcast, and we had a big long chat about all this. Yeah, I would love to get Billy on the chat. He's done like the Indian Ocean. He's done yeah. Pacific as well, hasn't he? Is that right? I think so. so. The Pacific. Yeah, I know he's, he's done definitely quite... done the Indian. I don't yeah, know. he's been around quite a long time as well. He's done, yeah. done a lot of stuff. I think he's an ex. Is he an ex fireman? Is that right? I don't know. Or was it maybe it was one of the other chaps 
on the in the four who is an ex fireman. Maybe that's what it was. But either way, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He strikes me as a really top guy. They they did like a podcast, didn't they? They I think they had a weekly podcast uh, yeah. with Monkey Fist that they did, and I think they're doing it again this year. Really yeah. interesting to follow. Really interesting. Yeah, it's great. They do get a lot of content out. They do really yeah. well. Yeah, it looks yeah. like it looks like they have fun as well doing yeah. it. Like some yeah. of the teams you see just don't like this. Seem like they're taking it too seriously, and it's like, guys, don't forget to have fun when you're exactly. out there because yeah, like people get to the other end, and you're like, how was that? And they're like, oh, I, I don't know. I just had my head down the whole way yeah. and and just did my shift and then went to sleep. And it's like, did you enjoy like the horizon or the middle of the ocean or the sun coming up or a moonrise? Yeah. And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, that's okay. the thing though isn't it because eventually you will be back to the modernity of just 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 boring everyday life at some point yeah. won't you and it's like you know enjoy enjoy no matter how hard this is going to be mentally physically and everything in, enjoy whenever you can enjoy it enjoy it because real life will <laughs> will be there eventually waiting for you won't it yeah it's, sure. like, it's like ross said it's like uh yeah we asked for this so enjoy yeah, yeah. every moment like no matter yeah. how miserable it is like enjoy yeah. it like be be grateful for it i remember, I remember on, on my trip there was days when you know sometimes you just wake up and you've got a cob on haven't you you just wake up and you're just yeah. you're just not in a good mood and 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 i had to do that i had to sort of get hold of myself sometimes and just go you're riding around the world you're an idiot do you know what i mean like you, yeah. you could be at home at work remember that there's people actually doing hard work at the moment and you're just sat on a motorbike and you're like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, okay then. Crack yeah. on. Yeah, worth reminding yourselves every now and then. Definitely. It's like you say, yeah, like you, uh, and it, but again, that's also the reality of travel and stuff, isn't it? It's like not every day is going to be brilliant and not mm. every day has to be an Instagram day. It's like some days you, you can tough it out and, and you're having a rough time and mm. that's part of it. And th- and it's a nice thing just to sort of also let people know that, the reality yeah. of what it's like every day. C'est la vie, man, isn't it? Such yeah. is life. That is life, isn't it? Not every day yeah. is an Instagram day. Fantastic. That's a great, great way to look at it. Me again, folks, just a short one. This we are also sponsored this month by the influencer store. If you go to teapot1.com, you'll go to the shop, check out any of the merchandise that I have available. That is all handled by the influencer store right here in the UK. I've got a quick bit of blurb to read out for them, and that is. The Influencer Store helps you build your brand, big or small, providing you with a solution and apparel. We help you to increase your fan base while supporting you with starting your own influencer clothing line with nothing more than just an idea or design. And there are no hidden costs. For more info, come check us out at theinfluencerstore.co.uk or drop us an email at online at influencerstore.co.uk for more information. Make sure you check them out, folks. Head to teapot1.com, head to the show, head to the shop. And you'll be supporting both the Teapot One channel and the podcast right here if you buy anything from the merchandise. So a massive thanks in advance to you and a huge thanks to the Influencer Store. And lastly, folks, I just want to say a massive thank you to you. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast, for watching the vids, for commenting, for liking, for sharing, for following and subscribing. It all is a massive, massive help. We're on a bit of an upturn at the moment. The podcast is gathering momentum. The channel is certainly doing really well. So a huge thanks to everybody who's been involved with that. If you want to go that extra mile, then you can always buy some merch over at teapot1.com. Or if you really want to get committed, you can join the clan over at patreon.com forward slash teapot one all links for everything are down below folks i appreciate any support in any form you can give all right then that's enough with the bag and bowl let's get back to the podcast uh mark scott bruce my question for you didn't you say you'd love to do something like this when do you think you could make that dream a real i did actually a couple of years ago i i still would you know i i remember after following i think it was two years ago three years ago i really followed the talisker challenge on instagram and it and it started. It start. There was embers, you know. That yeah. I the same sort of embers I had for the the bike ride uh, around the world. They started rearing their head, and I was like, "Oh, all right, okay. Is this on my horizon? Is this something I'm going to have to do?" And then I looked into it and saw like how much it cost for Talisker, and it was like, "Yeah, that's not going to happen for a long time yet." <laughs> yeah. Do you want to buy a boat? <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Um, I am going to say this. I am not. I'm not saying it won't happen. Oh, it's um, going to happen, Bruce. I can look at your eyes. Like you're I, I would love to do it. I, I genuinely would love to do it. I have a massive phobia about sharks because of Jaws, right? And I, I love being 
in the sea. I don't like being on it. Like yeah. the thought of treading water in the ocean scares the shit out of me. Just because as soon as I look at as soon as I look at the sea, all I hear is da, 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 <laughs> right? so the thought of getting in to scrape the bottom of the boat. I'm just like, no, God, no. But you got to do it, haven't you? Yeah. Um, it is something I would like to do, but it's not something I have to do yet. Yeah. And I'm not well, sure. We'll if it's... take you out on the boat next year or something. <laughs> yes. See what, yeah. Do you know what? I would love to. I, I would love let's to do, do something that. like that. That would be mega. Yeah, but we're back. Totally. Let, let's do it. We'll, we'll set a day and we'll we'll take you out on the boat and you can have a crack at it and see if that. that oh, Jesus. No. I just, felt, <laughs> I just felt something there. That's one step closer, isn't it? Oh, no. I've already said on this podcast that I'm cycling around the UK. So that has to happen. I've put it out there. That is happening. I'm not weird. sure if I'm doing it next year or it'll be the year after, but I am going to do it. So there you go. That is happening for sure. Go. The rowing one, I don't know yet. We'll see. But I would love I would love to do it. I just don't need to do it yet. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Tony Hannum, Andy and Roslyn, my heart goes off to you guys. My question for both of you is what was the... Ooh, my question for both of you is what was the darkest time in your trip? I think you got that wrong, Tony. They haven't done it yet. Mate. They're heading off in the, they're heading off in January. Uh, Bruce, have you made any plans regarding your rowing around the rowing around the UK? I wasn't rowing around, I'm cycling around the UK, Tony. Um not really. I started chatting with Mrs. Teapot about it. So um she hasn't said no yet. So <laughs> it's just a it's a question of fitting it around my job, effectively, YouTube. Um, and the tours and fitting it around sort of looking after the dog, believe it or not. <laughs> so one of us has to be at home to look after the dog. So it's just logistics at the moment, Tony, but we are getting there. How Chris big Kemp. is the dog? Could you? Uh, no, she's big. She's oh, um, too big for a bike. <laughs> uh, you, you, you could. You, you, you could, but she'd be a nightmare. She's she's That's like thirty four kilograms of muscle and thick as mints. So uh, she she'd be a handful. She'd be a real handful. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Next one, Chris Kemp. Hi all. Hope you're good. I'm assuming this far into the podcast, the beverages are flowing. So a simple one for you: If we evolve from apes, why do they still exist alongside us? I told you sometimes they could be a bit obscure. Right. Okay. What are your feelings on this then? If we evolved besides from besides apes. from apes, yeah. then why are they still here? Yeah. Ros is a scientist, so this oh, is, this way is to you. dip me in it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Over right. to you. Um well uh, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um I would say because uh there were different sets of circumstances, right? Mm. I don't think we evolved d directly from apes. I think we have a common descendant. Oh, did we not? I, I always, I thought we did. I thought we evolved from a type of ape. But I believe like modern apes have also evolved from that. Ah, okay. So we've all gone right? down different, different paths. And one I, of the paths has led to Homo sapiens and others has I, led to the gorilla, the chimpanzee, whatever. I, I mean, right. don't quote me on that in a scientific <laughs> journal, but... <laughs> Yeah, let's go with that. You're a scientist. I mean, you know, have you got an ology? Have you got an ology? No, physics. Not physics. I don't. I don't do. You know. Well, I mean, you're stuff. pretty much on par with Stephen Hawkins compared to most of us on this podcast. So uh, <laughs> you are the scientist, Stephen Hawkins. I got in so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on. What? Well, no, it was just like I said. She looked like Stephen Hawkins, and I got in loads of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> enough said about that one um, oh, okay I was expecting like a big long in-depth conversation on that one then alright so yeah it actually makes sense that you say it the way you just said it well yeah we all sort of evolved from apes and some of us went one path and others went another yeah, yeah. I mean that's what makes most sense to me it does now you've said it it does <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when, when I read the question out, I was like, it's a good question. How come we're not all like sat in cars, driving cars and building houses? Yeah. What's going on? All right. Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, keep it rubber side up, Bruce and uh, Andy and Rosalind. Keep dry or whatever the boating equivalent is. Basically wishing you the best for your trip. Thanks, mate. Last one of the clan questions. Andrew Gralton. Another wonderful example of individuals choosing a goal and working to make it uh, working to make it a relativity 
reality? A relative? Well, yeah, I think I think I think it's it must be reality. Yeah. Uh, my question is, what contact will you have during the crossing crossing with the outside world? We kind of touched on that then. So, yeah, you can have a team on on the mainland. Yeah, yeah, but to be honest, it's something we've been talking about is that whilst we'll have so Angus, who's our weather guy, will be basically sending us a text pretty much every day of what the weather is doing, whether it's better to go further north, further south. But whilst we have the ability to, I mean, if we wanted to, I could call my mum every single day, but we've been talking about the fact that we kind of don't want to yeah. be having that communication all the time so yep. we're talking at the moment about doing a kind of halfway point where people can send messages in and we read them there but i think if we're having them all the time and just texting people then it will almost be a little bit stressful and something that we don't need yeah. at the time yeah so i mean yeah. isolation is definitely part of the experience definitely mm -hmm. and so yeah to kind of break that just for a chit chat, I kind of, I'm not sure I want it right now. Mm -hmm. And no, I get that. I get that. So I didn't realize that you, you'd still have like easy contact like that and that you could just text away. I, th I thought it was like a satellite phone when the stars aligned kind of thing. So it is. So we have a couple of satellite phones that we can do voice calls on, but they're so advanced now that, you know, it's, it's not going to be like being in the same room, but you can mm. just phone people. Um, and then the text is just a little satellite device where they basically just sent an email via satellite. Wow. It's a bit more complicated to do photos and videos. You have to have a big unit that is exactly like trying to line it up to, you know, gotcha. a Minor and get it all, all sorted. But yeah, for actual just text and voice, then it's pretty pretty fine yeah like the iridium system's pretty much got coverage globally now and so wow. yeah once you're out there you you can get it so yeah so you've got like those emergency devices and and you can call pretty much every day but it's battery power again and uh -huh. the whole boat runs on solar so you are dependent on having enough sun to keep the batteries topped up and keep all the essential systems going so you're pretty frugal with everything, like every drop of water counts and, and every drop of battery power counts. So mm -hmm. it's like sort of wasting all that stuff just for calls home and stuff is one of those things that if stuff goes wrong and you start to lose all your power, mm -hmm. you're going to regret like absolutely that, uh, uh, beforehand. So you kind of need all that, uh, keep everything in reserve. Mm -hmm. So. And I get, I get what you're saying about the isolation factor as well. And I, I think, I think, I think, for me, I think I would want that as well in that, although, yeah, you have that capability to reach back to the the outside world, you're kind of, it's part of the trip, isn't it? Of putting yourself out in the middle of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, is, is that solitude and being isolated to that extent? Obviously, if the ship starts sinking, the boat starts sinking, yes, give me that phone. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah we've got like an EPIRB device, which is yeah. like a satellite beacon on, mm. on the phone and then PLBs like locator beacons on a life jacket. So like they go via satellite to Falmouth Coast Guard and they can oh. pretty much pinpoint your location within five meters. So if one of yeah. those beacons goes off, like they're just like send the nearest ship. So they know if if wow. things have gone really wrong, then then you can get get rescued like that and we'll just be lashed up in the life raft. But you know, hopefully it won't come to that. And yeah. Right. Wildlife. I spoke about sharks, but there's been there seems to be uh, an increasing frequency of um, uh, like marlin attacks on boats, isn't there? Like yeah. sailfish and stuff. They're actually putting the spikes through the boats. And yeah. there's, it seems to be happening more and more and more. What yeah. happens when that happens, if that happens? Well, repair it quick. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, so, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm taking bucket loads of plumbers, mate, and uh, mm. anything that sets underwater. Um, right to do that and you you patch the holes like one guy i think it was a year before last got struck like four times by yeah. a different marlin and yeah. like his his boat was starting to look like a sieve and and he'd run out of repair patches and epoxy to fix them and he ended up like drilling his chopping board through the boat and bolting it to the outside like the wow. final 
final patch to keep them going so yeah i mean again the boat designs are incredible and and like they're all compartmentalized and so you can flood a compartment or several compartments and not have any worry about it sinking but gotcha the biggest risk is 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 like if you're asleep in bed and it goes through the hole like mm. what what you're going to do then it, it's kind of it's pure luck that no one's been stabbed Stop. through the leg or the chest or anything like mm. that and then you've got a serious problem on your hands yeah. um, the what there was one was it last year the year before wasn't there where it lit as you just said it it went through the boat and if he'd been i think if he'd been sleeping on the mat it would have gone yeah. into him but he yeah. wasn't yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and oh so my God. on on this first aid course we did um it's never really been a thing before, but we're now doing trauma first aid. So we're taking mm. tourniquets and yeah. Yeah. Uh, sort of packing gauze and things. But the truth is, if you get stabbed badly in the middle of the ocean, we're pretty it's, done for. It's a bad time. So yeah. Yeah. the rule is, if you see a marlin, everyone is out of bed on deck because on deck you've got the two layers. So even yeah. if it comes through, you're not going to get. Yeah. Unless it's ten meters long. <laughs> Have they got any idea why th- there seems to be this this increase in marlin attacks? There's there's a couple of theories that that it seemed to start over like over COVID or or since COVID that that either it's sort of a, a lack of fishing or like there's there's like you know different more fish in certain areas or they're, they're coming in. No one's quite sure if they're being territorial or mm. if they're just hunting fish that sort of gather underneath the boat in the shade of the boat. Gotcha. Yeah. It could be that like, um, but yeah, no one's quite sure, but it's really only in the last few years that it's become mm. a problem. So yeah, they're, they're wondering if there's a link between that and like yeah. the lack of activity in COVID or, or what's going mm. on. But it's one of those things, do you know, to be honest, it's, it's like a lightning strike. Like, if it happens, you're just yeah. dead unlucky. Like, yeah, like yeah. Th- this, oh, I mean, it's a concern, but it's kind of maybe just don't worry about it because like, like Ross says, if you see a marlin in the water, everyone out on deck, yeah. that's the best protection. But, mm. but, but there's like, not a lot else you can do. No, there's not. There's not, is there? Yeah. yeah. And back home, you could get run over by a bus, couldn't you? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, These things absolutely. Happen. Shit happens in life. It's just... You know, yeah. you, you roll the dice, don't you, every day? So, see, so, um, that's interesting. That what you were just saying. I wonder if because because it's particularly the Talisker is getting more and more popular, isn't it? And I wonder if like the wildlife, the wild like the marlin have started realizing. Oh, hang on a minute, those things there mean food underneath them. I wonder if it's got to that extent where they actually recognise, oh, that's those things there, and they've got food underneath them. Do, do you think that maybe? Has a bearing I mean, it? they might be learning. I'm not sure if there's enough boats going over. There's only really a dozen boats a year that kind of go, and they oh, take right. such wildly different routes that, that mm. you know, once those mm. boats have left on day two, they never see each other again. I, to be honest, I think I'd be surprised if it was a learnt behaviour. Yeah. I think it's probably more a circumstantial change. Um, well, and now you say it, I like to think the marlin are out to get us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, never mind the great whites. Yeah. It's the marlin. Yeah. It's yeah. the marlin you got to watch. It's like, film. you know, when you give a drink to Neptune, give a drink to the marlin instead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 definitely. Are you superstitious? Um, Not in day to day life, but the sea makes you much more superstitious, I'd yeah, say. Bet. Don't you think? Uh, yeah, the sea makes you crazy. I don't, I don't whistle on the boat. There's like loads of like yeah. nautical superstitions and stuff. Like although it. officially taking a woman is quite bad luck. So I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. What is the yeah. whistle thing? I've heard of the whistle, but I never knew why. What, what uh, is that about? You blow up storms if you whistle on a boat. Encourages the wind. Yeah. Ah, so yeah okay. Whistling on board mm. and things. And but there's loads of things like that. Like I mean, you God, you could drive yourself crazy because there's, yeah. you know, there's like yeah, if you cross the equator, you there's like rituals mm. that everyone does and yeah, and like I know in Indonesia and things like surfers aren't allowed to wear green and stuff like that. So well, I think it's the, I think it's the color of one of the one of the ocean gods, and so you're you're causing offense mm. or, or or something if you if you go surfing in a green wetsuit or anything like that or have a green board mm. wow. so you can really see how sailors of old were so superstitious though oh, because yeah. it's such a weird feeling having the weather feel like it's sort of enclosing you and having you know 
almost the water trying to attack you from below. It's sort of, it makes such a huge difference. Have you heard of um, St. Elmo's Fire? Not the film, the uh, like weather thing. No, I've, I've only ever heard of the term, but I never knew what it was. So essentially it's this phenomena where old ships in low pressure, where there's basically a lot of electric in the atmosphere, it made the masts glow purple. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when a lightning strike is purple and the sky is kind of purpley, yeah. it's the same sort of thing. And so if you were in the 17th century on this big wooden ship and the mast started glowing purple, wow. I would believe in some mad superstitions. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And then and it's some of the um, some of the noises. I, like, I remember seeing, I was on... Oh, bloody hell. I'm 46 years old. I was on TikTok recently. I posted <laughs> something on TikTok. And then, like, obviously, are, are you on TikTok at all? No. Nice. Was it you dancing? Were you? <laughs> no, there? it definitely wasn't me. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, they'll they'll chuck a video your way. And the second you start scrolling on TikTok, that's it. R right an hour off. You're just there. Yeah. And and these videos started coming up of this. He's a crab fisherman. So he's he's out in horrendous weather, you know, like deadliest catch type of thing. Yeah. But this, this is American guy. And he basically started filming him jumping every time that when the boat was in really rough weather, he'd jump and it was just like acrobatics. Yeah. But he captured this like ungodly noise. It genuinely sounded like a woman screaming really? in the wind. And, he, and the first vid that he did, he was just like, what is that? Like he's got the video and he his phone. He's like, "What is that?" And he starts running all around the boat looking. But it happens so often, and it must be some weather phenomena. I don't know, but it happens so often. He's got loads of videos now of it, and like people are posting up in comments, going, "Well, it could be this. Is it that? Is it a whale? Is it a lift?" Yeah. You know, and and it sounds like a woman screaming is what it sounds like. So you can totally imagine the sailors of old just being like, you know, yeah. mermaids and the demons yeah. in the oceans and stuff. Yeah, straight away. That's I mean, cool. I remember like I was out in the Irish Sea and it was completely foggy, like no visibility. And and um, and I was I was not far off the shore, but the I just heard this howling out of nowhere. And it was like it sounded like a werewolf or something howling. And I said, yeah. oh, God, what is this? Suddenly everything, when you don't really know your environment or what's going on and it's foggy, it's awful. Like I was like, God, is that where, what, what is that? It was seals. And I'd never heard a seal screaming or howling before, but they, wow. yeah, they were howling like on the rocks. And I was absolutely terrified until I realized <laughs> what it was. I sort of came a bit closer to shore and then there's fog lifted and then there they were sort of lined up, like having a laugh at me. And I was like, yeah, like you can definitely see how, like those sort of superstitions build up over the years. And like, yeah, if I had something I bet, screen, I bet like, those yeah. seals were on the rocks and they were like, yeah, Fred, here's another one. Do that <laughs> yeah, again. Do that guy, thing you do. Go on, do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> They're big buggers, seals, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. It's all fun I, and games until one bites you on the bum. I, the I, I, I grew up in the northeast of Scotland near Peterhead, right up in the, the sort of top yeah. corner, a bit north of Aberdeen. So me and my mate Crookie, we used to go fishing off off of the breakwaters that they have in Peterhead. So they have these big, long, I think one's like half a mile. They're about half a mile long, these breakwaters. And they jut out in this massive big bay. It used to be a big whaling port back in the day. So you're almost in deep water. You know, you can get cod and ling and conger eels and everything off of there. And I remember we were about 13, 14 and my mate Crookie has gone down the steps to the to the sea off the, the end of these breakwaters to bring in a big cod that he'd caught. And as he's down, he's like reaching in to pick up, it's like someone out of Jaws this, he's reached in to pick up this cod, turned round to me to basically go, <laughs> I've got one. And as he turned round, this, this seal came out the water like to eat the, the cod. The thing was like... Jesus, it was about at least one and a half times the size of Crookie, wow. if not double. It was massive. Yeah. <laughs> he shits himself. This is it. Yeah, it's when that happens that you suddenly realise, you're like, we don't belong out here. Yeah. Like, oh. I, I can't swim properly. I can't yeah. get away. Like, yeah, you realise, like, you don't belong there. Like, and yeah, oh God, that would have been, I would have shit my pants. That would have been terrible. <laughs> what, are your, what are your feelings about... I shouldn't I shouldn't say this obviously because you're the guys that are going to be out in the ocean doing this. You know when you have to get in the water and scrape the bottom of the boat. Obviously mm -hmm. I've said what I'm worried about. 
Do you have any concerns about that? Or how do you, how do you deal with that? The unknowns of the deep? Personally, doesn't bother me at all. I'm weirdly quite comfortable in the water. Um, Rosalind's just volunteered herself for cleaning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same as you. Like, like uh, I, I'm quite happy on the surface, but like... Uh, uh, no, opposite. No, I am quite. I don't like yeah. being in the water. I'm happy on top. I don't oh no, get... I'm the opposite. I don't mind being yeah, underneath. No. It's been on the oh, water. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. The... Like I would love to cage dive with with sharks with great whites. I would love to do that. Genuinely, I'd love to do that. But to be just like treading, treading water yeah. and stuff, getting mm-hmm. under the boat and dealing with it, I think I would shit myself. But I think I'd still be okay. It's the thought of jumping in and then going under. I'm just like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, unknown. I... I think, yeah, goggles on and then poke your face in first and yeah. just see if there's anything under there. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, it's not something I'm looking forward to, like getting under the boat. Like, mm. um, yeah, that's... He'll send me instead. I'm going to send Ross, yeah, she's <laughs> going to do that. I'm not, well, not going to brave it out and go, yeah, listen, darling, I'm the man here. I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Equal me. opportunities, Andy, equal yeah, opportunities. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to be... After you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, that's all the uh, clan questions over on Patreon. Are you guys okay for time? Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's go. go. Awesome. Right. We've got some questions over on Instagram. So that's at teapot one Insta. Obviously, I will leave um, Andy and Rosalind's socials down below as well, folks. So make sure you give them a like and a follow. First one here, Josh Hool 46. How you doing, Josh? What tipples do you take on board and what sneaky snacks? We kind of covered that. But um, all right. Apart from your dried, your dried sort of pot noodley type meals yeah. and your biscuits, what else yeah. are you taking? Um, we, we're going to take a bit of spice rum for halfway across, like just to celebrate midway. That um, was going to be my question. Like, what yeah. have you got markers where you'll have? Yeah, just a little tipple. But, but weirdly, I th- I don't know if it's a salt air or just that you're knackered that, that I really went off booze around Britain and just mm. wasn't up for it. I had a little bottle of, of, of uh, rum with me and maybe got like a third of the way through it. And it was just really? a quarter. Like I didn't drink at all. I just couldn't do it. Like I'd have a mouthful. I'm like, then that's me done. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so that that in terms of, of a little sneaky star way, definitely. Mm. But snack wise... Chocolate, flapjack, party rings, uh, nuts, loads jerky, of built on, yeah, like, yeah. like just calories, protein, high calories. Fat. yeah, 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 yeah right fat right. and calories, like anything getting like, like, uh, we're again, like, like you were saying earlier, the cost of the the freeze dried rations is mm. is eye watering, and and so the porridge is the same you're paying a fortune for porridge so we 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 basically christmas is going to be like a factory in the kitchen of just like a couple of massive buckets filled with kilos of oats and then we're going to be chucking in like protein powder and freeze-dried fruit and stuff like that and then when we go two mega tubs of nutella and and peanut butter (laughs) and then you just like dollop a scoop in when you when you're there making up your breakfast and stuff so like it is those little treats like that and again like a little tip someone gave me duncan gave me the tip of like have a boat treat every day that's not just for you it's like morale treat for the Mm. day so whatever it is andy loves a cream egg cream egg for halfway i think is that's my mile marker it's like literally i'm gonna buy them all up like before we go like hopefully cream eggs normally come out like first of january don't they it's ridiculous now you must be able to get them on amazon or something for sure yeah yeah it's like when andy's done good he gets a cream egg so like every (laughs) every like so good boy 100 miles yeah yeah get that keep running good boy Nice one, that Josh. Uh, next one, Tommy GS fan. Looking forward to this one. Cheers, Tommy. I hope you're enjoying it. Official Mr. Fish. How you doing, John? Hi. Fantastic thing to do. I don't know you, but I'm weirdly proud. My dad was an avid lifeboat supporter and hated boats. My question is, Bruce once said to me he'd like to row across an insane piece of water. I can't remember what. What tips can you give Bruce or anyone thinking of doing a long distance row? Um, I'd say talk to people would be the first step. So many people who've done it are, like I said earlier, so generous with their time. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to people, see what they've done, see what's possible. Even if you don't have a mega budget to do something like the Atlantic, maybe you could sort of borrow a boat for the summer and do 
Land's End to John O'Groats or something. Mm. Although mm. actually that's quite hard, so you would need support. But um, yeah, that would be my advice. Yeah. Talk to people. Yeah, um, cool. learn as much as you can. Like like the, like Ross says, there's so many people out there that will be generous with their time. But you, it's not one of those trips or projects that you can do just off the cuff just go oh i'm just going to jump in a boat and go like like i think like everyone this week's been telling me about saving lives of sea and like like someone went out just on a un- unsupported training run with no kit no nothing and just got swept out to sea and it happens like it and it's a real danger of like ocean rowing like getting a real bad name for itself because people just jump on the boats have a go and the the rnli are just pulling them out of the water left right and center mm. and mm. And it's not cool. Like they're, they're not there. They're not the AA. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, they're yeah. there for emergencies only and things will go wrong. And it's a sport with risks, mm-hmm. but you have to be prepared. You've got to know your kit. You've got to know the boat mm-hmm. inside out. You've got to know where you're going and you've got to know the tides, particularly when you're training around the UK. Like there's so much complexity, like the tide doesn't just go from Bournemouth to Calais and back again. You know, it's like, like there's like tidal currents around the coast that sort of drag you up and down from Cornwall back up to Dover. And, and you have to know that stuff and you have to be humble and you've got to sort of Mm. accept that you're never going to beat nature out there. Like the sea is, is a beast and you have to give it the respect it deserves. So it's that thing, like learn as much as you can and, and know what you're doing before you go, because it's not just going to be all right. Like you Mm. really have to be on top of it. And that's why it takes so long to prepare for it. It's like, you know, we're just itching to go and get on with it, but we sort of accept that there's a procedure to doing it on on this. Like, like there's other adventures or or projects you can just jump on and just go. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this ain't one of them. That's something that I really took from following uh, Damien was that the, the sea nature will be what nature will be. And as you just said, there is no beating it. So it's, what you said for him initially, I remember him saying was he thought he could beat it. Like if he just gets on and he rows and he rows and he rows and he rows with everything that he's got, he can he can beat it. But he said he soon realised that it's, it's damage limitation. So, you know, some days you just have to chuck the old, is it the parrot anchor? Is that what they call yeah. it, the big shoot? You just yeah. have to accept that, okay, I'm going to chuck this out and I might lose 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles. Fair enough. You just got to accept that fact and deal with it. Um, yeah. Okay then. So as as a total rookie, as a as some idiot stood in their room going, I fancy doing something like that, where would be the first port of call then? Where, where, where would you go to sort of introduce yourself to this community and dip your toe in the water to, to start things moving? I'd probably say the Facebook. Group. Yeah, there's a couple there's a of Facebook places. group called It's the Ocean Rowing Society on, yeah. on Facebook. Like okay. they are like full of information and and huge mix of people of like coaches mm-hmm. and just interested people. Um the there's the, the boat manufacturers and and uh like other organizers. Like again, Talisker is that one stop shop if you've got the cash, like call them and, and you'll be put down on the wait list and and there's loads of knowledge there. If you want to go independent, yeah, hit the Facebook group and you'll get leads very quickly into into that. Well, give me a call. Like, I'm more than happy to sort of point people in the right direction and, awesome. and like, yeah, get go on our Instagram or drop us an email. Like, like more than happy to sort of like show people what everyone showed me. And, mm-hmm. and and Andy is very humble, but he coaches a lot of the teams who row independently around Britain now and sort of really? guides them around and stuff, but. So he does know whatever you want to do, the right person to get in touch with. So yeah, yeah. I volunteer him. <laughs> you're, you're a, you, you plainly are a, a not shout from the rooftops type of person, aren't you? You're just, you're there if the information is needed and you'll pass it, but you're not one that's going to stand there and go, I can do this. You know, yeah. like, come Look see me. me. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It, it is that thing. Yeah, I've guided a couple of teams around in the last, since I, I rode, I've guided a few teams around and done oh, their yeah. weather routing for them and stuff. So yeah, it, it's it's a nice thing to sort of pass on the knowledge that was sort of given to me. And, and yeah. yeah. I, I love that. I think that's all you can do, isn't it? It's, it's, it's nice to just pass the baton on and as you just said, pass on your experience, your knowledge and go from there. Nice one. Cheers, John. That was a great question, mate. Thank you. Uh, Captain Pugwash rides. So, what's he saying? Uh, tie his beard up. 
for Teapot One. Tie his beard up or else you'll get waterlogged. Cheers. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dave, the sidecar dog. Andy oh, isn't looking is. forward to the bucket, but as they'll be... Oh, did you meet Dave at the... the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Dave's in the... Both Dave. Daves are in the 100 Club, actually. Oh, fantastic. Nice yeah. one, Dave. Good on you. Good on you. Uh, he says, Andy isn't looking forward to the bucket, but as they'll be living in such a small space during this adventure, will it double up as anything else to save space? Rosalind is the person... Okay, well, let's cover that first then. Do you use the bucket for anything other than... It's, it's also the washing tub, yeah. Yeah, so we wash no. our clothes in the same bucket. Yeah. We have sterilising stuff. We'll give it a squirt first. But, I mean, I mean, the truth of the matter is, by, like, week two, you're so disgusting anyway. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, the, the Roz showed me footage that I'd forgotten about of when she checked it all out of us rowing around Britain. And take two buckets. Yeah. We- Space. <laughs> <laughs> One in the other one, just fit it inside. Okay, no, that's we, not a so we do idea. have we have like a squidgy <laughs> bucket thing as well, which would collapse if you sat on it. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but for more washing. But for yeah. washing, yeah, 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 yeah. For... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought you were taking the mic. I didn't realize you actually were going to wash your stuff in the shit bucket. No, you do. Yeah. Oh wow, really? Yeah. Uh, well, I did. Like, Ros might bring a bit more hygiene to the affair. But... I might bring a squidgy bucket. Yeah. I think everyone else takes two buckets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that'll explain the smell when I finish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's literally, so there's this great video when he's rowing back up the Thames, six months at sea, and he's sort of smelling himself and going, mm. do you know what? I think it's true what they say. You self clean after a little while. <laughs> I don't smell at all. And then there's photos of him getting off and his family going, like, refusing <laughs> to hug him because he absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, that's well, brilliant. I'm told, I'm told the smell was phenomenal. Like, uh, I, I mean, I can only get it from, I had a shower that night and then uh, the days after I had to get in and clean the boat and the cabin was vile. Like, literally like a homeless guy had been in it for six months yeah. and well there had been a homeless guy in it for six months and i just stank it was uh, i remember that smell i i used i don't know if you know i used to be a police officer and i remember the cells sometimes when you had you had people in there who hadn't washed in a long time or did certain things in the cell oh my god the smell was horrendous oh. yeah. yeah we're relying on Ros to clean up the action here <laughs> Uh, right, next one from Dave. Rosalind is the person most likely to lose things overboard, but what <laughs> musical choice of Andy's would she throw overboard first? I'm oh. guessing music will be a big help during the crossing. Okay, that's another question. So this one. Um, musical choice of Andy's that you'd throw overboard first. Oh, God. I don't know. There is... We're quite similar in... Well, I like a bit more Amber, but... Um... Is there anything of yours I'd throw overboard? I don't know. Like, um, like I've, I mean, I've got a pretty eclectic mix, anything from like Pixies to Bob Dylan and stuff. So it's sort I was going like, to say, what's the playlist? Yeah. Varied. I, and if people want to suggest songs, please do. Yeah, start a playlist. That would be love epic. It. Like, so yeah, I love it. Um, what would I throw overboard? Anything. There, there are certain noises that like just stress me out a little bit when I'm tired. I think anything that's too screamy doesn't doesn't say Yeah, whereas well. like, yeah, if I want to get a shift on, then angry music is for me. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Pixies, yeah. Nirvana and stuff like that and get there. So yeah. You... Whereas I love a power ballad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meatloaf, Bonnie Tyler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> John Paul. Oh, wow. <laughs> love it. Yeah. This yeah, is gonna yeah. be a party, but this is <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> When you were saying about noises, one thing that just jumped in my head is my wife. My wife hates hearing people eat, and I and I get it. If if people are like rah, 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 really noisy, like a dog eating, it, I get that. Yeah. But with like, she'll look at me. We'll be sat in the living room or something, and I'll be eating like a, a sandwich or something, and you make a just a like an inconspicuous noise from eating, and she's just glowering at me. And I'm like, what am I supposed you know to what? do? I have the same thing. Do you? I don't know what it is. And I really try not to like act on it because I know yeah. it's my problem. Yeah. But there is just, I don't know. Yeah. There's just yeah. something about it that sends my brain going, 
I, I eat with my mouth closed on the pain of death. <laughs> I just sit there with my mouth open like that, and yeah. and look at her right in the eye. What you're going to do on the bucket? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave's got one more there. Um, I'm guessing music will be a big help during the crossing. So, which song is their joint favourite? It's got to be John Parr. Or is oh, it? No. Oh, Kuchaka. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is that? Bit of reservoir. Uka, 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 that one. Yeah. 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 Um, that's what's that movie. song called? From Ooh. Guardians of the Galaxy, but like... Uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy Reservoir soundtrack. Dogs. Come on. It's Reservoir yes. Dogs, yes. originally. I'm yeah. sure my Apologies. age here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the whole soundtrack we very much enjoy. Yeah. It's I, good, I got Jeff. a feeling. That's what it's called. That's Sorry, it's yeah, been yeah, bugging me as soon as you started saying that. I was like, what is yeah. that song? I've yeah, got a feeling. That, that. We also like the Pina Colada song. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. what else do we like? I think it's anything like it, it, it music's at its best on board when it just digs you out of a hole, yeah. so yeah. like anything like just a bit cheery and yeah. and yeah, fun. That, and so when cool. I'm proper down, I just need to listen to uh, Man in Motion. Saint El- bracket Saint Elmo's fire, oh, yeah. and I'm absolutely happy yeah. as Larry again. <laughs> I don't know what, but it just absolutely. You, you said it. You said it before that um, Guardians of the Galaxy uh, soundtrack, phenomenal, yeah. isn't it? That is yes. brilliant. That is yeah, like yeah. a feel so good, good soundtrack. So good. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, definitely taking that on the playlist. Definitely. Nice one. And Dave also says, P.S., can you remind them to bring us back a fridge magnet and a stick of rock and to send us a postcard? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Don't know how you're going to do the postcard thing, but, you know. Uh, and the last one is the RNLI. They say, huge good luck to everyone taking part. Wishing you safe rowing. Oh, you know? cheers, guys. Bless them. Yeah. I, like I say, like, phenomenal charity. Like, every every row or expedition I do is it's raising money for those guys because again around Britain I, I met so many of the crews and it's all volunteers in local communities mm-hmm. jumping on boats in terrible weather to go out and get people and like I, I was caught in a couple of gales when I was out there and it's just terrifying you're in a little bay on an anchor just trying to let it blow through and yeah I, I always kind of say you've never really been scared until you've been scared by the sea because it was a new level of terrifying yeah. and just have blokes and girls on, on shore that go, we'll go, we'll go and get them. For, yeah. they, they don't have to, they don't have to do that. Mm. And so, yeah, yeah. Hats off to them. I love it. What a great charity. It's a very special, um, dare I say service, but it's, it's a very special thing that they do, isn't it? Yeah, just absolutely. As you said, they're not getting paid for that, are they? So it's, it's sort of, out of the yeah. kindness of their heart to go and do it. I was going to ask, what what is the connection with these charities then? Well, the so, RNLI and Blue Marine Foundation. For me, the RNLI started by prepaying my own rescues. So, mm. like, uh, it literally, <laughs> I was like, look, I'm going to spend this much time in the coast around Britain. Like, these guys are the guys that are going to go out and help yeah. if it's needed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so that's where it, the the charity for me started and then getting to know the coxswains and the crews around the country that I'm still in touch with now um was really special and and yeah like I say hats off to them for what they do so I, I think they're well worth supporting and then, and then charity. yeah the Blue Marine Foundation are a ocean science and conservation charity which very much my kind of cup of tea so like I say, I work in science education and I do a lot of earth sciences and environmental sciences as well. And they do some yeah. amazing work that is really, uh, there's often within conservation, this kind of battle between particularly in an ocean environment, sort of fishing versus conservation, whereas they do it mm. in a really equitable way. So, you know, fishermen have a really bad time if there are no fish in the water because of you know, habitat loss. So they do it in a really community focused way with the local people in each area and yeah. sort of, uh, you know, oyster re- rewilding essentially. So yeah, they do some amazing policy and conservation work around the UK and internationally. So that's kind of where they came in. Oh, okay. Right. I get you. Uh, that, that to me, it, it makes sense, isn't it? And that, you know, we're all we we are, we will always fish. We're always going to reap the harvest from the sea that we can. But as you said, it's a it's a question of trying to find a balance there where we can get what we need from it without 
screwing it up completely. Have you seen Sea Spiracy? I'm, I'm assuming you must have watched Sea Spiracy. I have, yes. Jeez. What did you think of that? Um, no, <laughs> we're getting deep now. Um, okay. I thought it was a very good way of highlighting some issues. I thought it was a little bit one dimensional on yes. some some issues that yeah. are a lot more complex than yeah. it suggests. Yeah. And yeah, there's a big difference between the huge trawlers that are, you know, digging up half the seabed and local fishermen who are trying to fish sustainably. I think Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I sorry, go on, apologies, go on. No, it it was a good way of starting a conversation, I'd say. Yeah, that, that was it. I think it for me personally, it I watched it and I was just like, holy fuck, was screwed. And and it put me off like any type of seafood for, for about six months. I was like, I'm not, I'm not touching anything. I'm not doing anything. That's incredible. But then, as you said, I, the more I started talking to various different people on the podcast and just in day-to-day life, it's like, yeah, hang on a minute. You know, that 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 documentary is to highlight their message trying to step back and have a bigger look at it take a bigger picture of it of it and as you just said yeah it was it was very true in that <clears throat> excuse me what i hope i said earlier and that we are we, we can't not fish P- people people rely on it for livelihoods from the local villages through to you know the people on the factory ships they've still got families to look yeah. after don't they so we're always going to have to reap the, the the harvest from the sea but it's going to be a question of trying to trying to reach a sustainable level isn't it yeah yeah, yeah how, it's how making do you sure do that? It's, it's it's making sure it's there to be fished for mm. the next generation as well mm-hmm. absolutely and yeah, sustainability yeah, yeah. isn't just stopping everything we do at the moment it's mm-hmm. making sure we can keep doing things whether that's balancing like traditional farming with rewilding they don't have to be against each other they can Mm -hmm. work really well side by side and benefit both because like i say if a fisherman's got nothing to fish then you know they're stuffed right Mm -hmm. so it is just really striking the balance and good environmental work is having those things hand in hand working together yeah absolutely yeah definitely um i hadn't i'd never heard of blue marine foundation to be honest with you so folks what i'll do is i'll leave links for both the rnli and the blue marine foundation down below um as well as the uh, atlantic escapade website all your socials i'll put them all down down by as well guys that's us done all the questions is there anything that we've not addressed that you you want to chat about no, no. I, think, I, think we, I think we covered it. The, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of it. Um, yeah, I just say, you know, when we go, we'll have a satellite tracker. So, yeah, you'll be able to follow us along if that's something you fancy. Um, mm-hmm. We'll hopefully take messages on the halfway so you can send us a row faster message. <laughs> um, and, yeah, if anyone just wants to chat about Ocean Rowing, the RNLI, the Blue Marine yeah. Foundation, whatever. We're always Drop us an email. Yeah. Yeah. Always yeah. keen. It's just been nice chatting about it, to be honest. It's like, you know, I'd sort of listening to the podcast and the guys that have done epic stuff. Like we haven't really done it yet. And so, like, you know, it's like yourself and Thor, the stuff he was doing. And then like, you know, you've got Simon and Lisa Thomas on it. And it's like all these people that have done these epic things. So like we're we're, we're really grateful to you, you guys are no yeah. different, honestly. You're no different. Don't worry about it. Uh, I <laughs> I would love once once you've done it, whatever happens on the voyage and the adventure ahead, I'd love to get you back on in the future and we can have another chat about it if you're up for it. One hundred percent, that'd be fun. One hundred percent, let's Beautiful. do it, and then and we'll book that that test array. We'll get you out in the sailor. Yeah. And I mean, I'd love to do it. Break. Absolutely, yeah, I would love it. to do that. Oh dear! Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can see where this is going. <laughs> right, folks, make sure I'll leave all the links down below. Make sure you give the guys a bit of a follow, a like, a subscribe. And if you fancy being part of the 100 Club, again, give them the support that uh, they, they need for this. I wish you the very best of luck on the adventure. I can't wait to follow it. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us on. It's been cool. Cheers, man. I, I've loved it. Thank you very much for spending your Friday evening chatting, chatting to me. It's been great. Right, folks, hope you've enjoyed this one. Uh, Keep doing your thing. Get on out there whenever you can. Look after those that you love. But most importantly, most importantly, live your life. Woo-ha! Cheers, guys. I loved that. That was awesome.